Uh, Professor Kahn, many thanks for coming here to Tarragona. Can you tell us briefly what you do uh, in Geneva these days? Uh, well, what I'm currently doing mainly is to be a professor of economics at the Faculty of Translation and Interpreting at the University of Geneva, which is a uh, school which originally was founded 75 years ago uh, with a very professional orientation and which progressively has been evolving and has increasingly moved towards being a full-fledged academic institution and a fully-fledged faculty out of the eight faculties that we have at the University of Geneva. Good. Great. Um, how did you get to where you are now? If you, uh, this is the standard question. We go yeah. back to when you were doing your own doctorate or beginning mm -hmm. doctoral mm -hmm. studies. Well, my own PhD was unrelated to language, even though language had always been one of my, my chief core interests. Uh, I did come that close to never doing economics, but doing Celtic studies instead. But <laughs> that was probably my deep, genuine interest. It was, you know, Irish, Welsh, you speak, Gaelic. You speak Gaelic. Ah, uh, that'll be Gaelic. I speak a little bit of okay, Irish, sure. and I spent some time out there. Uh, uh, but frankly, it was very difficult back then because there was absolutely no offer of such courses in Switzerland, where I'm from, and uh, there was, you know, the only possibility would have been to find a lot of money and spend uh, all that money studying in somewhere in the British Isles, which was simply not, not, not feasible. At the same time, I did have this interest in economics, so I did my, my PhD on fairly technical microeconomics. It was in microeconomics. In, in, in Switzerland? Then. In Geneva. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but in, in, in French? In, in French. We should explain your mother tongue is... French. Well, French is my mother tongue. It's my right. one and only mother tongue. I never spoke a word of English until I was something like 14. Really? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, uh, after this, so when I was done with my PhD, I thought, well, my, my, you know, my real interest is really language, multilingualism, diversity, multiculturalism, education to some extent. So, I, uh, you know, I, I poked around a bit and uh, one of my advisors on my PhD committee told me, oh, there are some people in Canada, economists, who do work on language. You should get in touch with Senso. Uh, which I did, and I uh, also got a grant from the Swiss federal government to study abroad and do postdoctoral studies abroad. Remember that back in the days, where uh, doing what, taking one degree from one university and another from another university was not exactly frowned upon, but certainly not easy. It has, mm -hmm. you know, mobility has vastly increased. Back then, it was not the case, mm -hmm. so we would make up for it by having mobility after a PhD. So yeah. I did apply for one of those grants, went to Canada. I thought I was going to go away for one year and work on language economics for one year. Well, lo and behold, it has become my career very much and I've been doing this for over 20 years now. So I went to Montreal, uh, f spent about a year and a half there, then I went to Seattle to work with somebody else in, uh, 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 who's also doing, well, more like rational choice in language. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went back to Montreal, following which I, I did some research work in Geneva for a few years. And then I went to the north of Germany, where I spent three years as the deputy director of the European Center for Minority Issues, which is an interdisciplinary center working on majority and minority relations. But that's not economics, then? That's, that's uh, another I, disciplinary location, or is it...? Well, yes and no. It is interdisciplinary. Yeah. So, it says in, in, you know, in the course of, of, of my, my career, I guess, uh, um, you know, even though economics is, is my my intellectual home, so to speak, uh, at various points in succession, various other disciplinary inputs have come in. Mm. Uh, it all started when, just around the time of my PhD, I met, uh, made the acquaintance of a uh, great social linguist, Joshua Fishman. Mm. So I told him about my interests. He said, oh, that's very interesting. But uh, first thing you have to do is read your sociolinguistics. Mm. And, uh, well, if the time comes, when you're ready, Get, get in touch with me, and I'll give you a full issues on of the inter, International Journal of Sociology of Language for this topic, language economics, economics and multilingualism. So I said, okay, good. So, and at the time, I, I left for, for the stay in Canada and started reading my social linguistics. And um, at, at some stage, I got a, like two, three years later, I got a message from Fishman who said, well, I've been following what you've been doing over the past few years, mm -hmm. and I think you're ready. Now, uh, prepare an issue of the IJSL, please. Uh, which Sorry, of the, the IJSL, International Journal of the Sociology of Language, okay. which, you know, which I started doing, and the issue came out in 1996, on uh, the economics of uh, 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 language and language. I don't remember the title exactly, but about the economics of language and multilingualism. And language you were policy. editing this. Then. I was. Uh, uh, yeah, I was the guest. The, the well, yeah, the issue guest issue editor, yep. whatever it's called, 
uh, uh, for that particular issue by JSL. And uh, so, you know, uh, even though economics was the, uh, uh, my port of call, so to speak, uh, there has been lots of contact with uh, uh, sociolinguistics and sociolinguists, following which uh, uh, the few years that I spent back in Switzerland, after Canada, the US and Canada, I was in Switzerland for five years, and there uh, uh, most of the language economics that I've been able to do were under the auspices of a, a, a program in education. It was a federal research program with a fair bit of money in the context of which it was possible to develop various lines of research, including the economics of language education and foreign language teaching and training. Uh, so at that stage, I brought in lots of, I, was, I had to bring in lots of elements from the education sciences. Then I got this job in the north of Germany, where the, the main partner disciplines were um, well, to some extent, law, uh, international relations, because it was very much uh, uh, oriented towards Eastern and Central Europe, even though my responsibilities were mostly to deal with majority-minority relations in Western Europe, although it was you know, my, my main area of concentration. Uh, so that meant another disciplinary input, and so on and so forth. So if, if you know, I could, in a sense, like, like tell the story of the last 20 years uh, uh, in terms of uh, a br an expanding range of interdisciplinary contacts and mm -hmm. bridge building. Was it problematic that your doctoral thesis wasn't on language translation? I mean, you've changed from your doctoral thesis, mm -hmm. you've, you've, you've ventured out into other areas. Was yes and no, but the guiding thread has always been, the guiding thread has always been the same. The guiding thread has always been Ever since I completed the PhD on, again, you know, microeconomics and uncertainty applied to time and location, mm. the, the emphasis has always been on, um, on diversity management, how either people or organizations or states uh, or society more generally, how they deal with linguistic and cultural diversity, uh, uh, what are the benefits, what are the costs, and I'm not only talking about material and, or, or, or financial benefits and costs, but also symbolic ones. And, and how you how you identify them, measure them, uh, how you take policy decisions, taking these costs and benefits into account. So, you know, in a sense, it's very much as you know to take another metaphor, uh, as if you know when, when you sail, you take a succession of tacks. Mm -hmm. So tacks have been taking me left you know where and right, you're going. right. <laughs> yes. still going in the <laughs> same direction. Okay. And I think there is, and I really, you know, as, as I said, you know, looking back in the last twenty plus years, I said, well, you know, it's it's a pretty straightforward line, uh, but with with the added advantage of having had the opportunity or having been forced to, in a sense integrate uh, uh, things from various disciplines, inputs from various disciplines. And recently, because of my appointment at the School of Translation Interpreting, well, faculty now, because we changed names recently, um, uh, I'm increasingly interested in things that are connected with translating. Has it occurred to you that, especially social linguistics, but also the economic approaches to, to multilingualism, have ignored translation throughout oh, the yes, 80s yes, and the yes, 90s. Yes. It's just not on their agenda. It's Fishman never really discusses translation. Well, Fishman and, and, and I would say almost nobody else. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is a striking fact. And uh, uh, in, in, recent, in recent years, I mean, I, I, and I've been thinking about uh, various developments which we can talk about again, I'll talk about again in a moment. Um, and I think one of the very important things to do in terms of macro level diversity management is not so much in terms of choosing the optimal strategy. I don't think there is one optimal strategy. I think what is optimal is to build an architecture which combines different strategies for dealing with linguistic and cultural diversity. Mm. And the it, translation would be one absolutely. of those things. And I would say, well, okay, it is, in a sense, it's the elephant in the room. Uh, it's been largely ignored, and one of I mean, to me, and, and that, that that ties in with another issue, which is probably closer to your interest in the sociology of translation, is how can this be explained in terms of reciprocal perceptions and in terms of perceptions of the various specializations, 
whether in terms of professional activity or in terms of academic positioning, uh, what explains this, uh, 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 this trough or this cleft in a sense that has very much left translation studies mm. apart. And I, I, what I find extremely stimulating about this and, and, and opens up a whole range of new issues is, well, what can we do and how can we develop bridge building between translation studies and other uh, uh, approaches to multilingualism in society. It's, it's part of the problem within translation studies itself. We, of... We've been training translators for 50 years, and that's been our central task institutionally. Yes. Without seeing the wider linguistic and cultural the, I, I would assume, I mean, at this point, this is the assumption that I would be working with indeed, is that part of the problem, uh, I mean, oh, no, no, let's start with the fact that obviously, on the one hand, uh, uh, the main canonic disciplines and also the interdisciplines like sociolinguistics, for example, or some segments of applied linguistics, or uh, other approaches rooted in the social and economic sciences in the, large, you know, in the broad sense, have tended to ignore translation and dismiss it as a merely technical skill, period. Uh, to some extent, however, I would think that uh, translators themselves, either as a profession or the trainers of translators uh, as you know, as trainers, as people with an academic background who are supposed to pass on a certain amount of knowledge, but also to think scientifically about the status and the development of this knowledge. I think part of the responsibility resides there as well. Uh, but again, I'm only in the beginning of this investigation and you're far more advanced than I am in that. But uh, I would tend to think that m much of it has to do with an, an uh, over, uh, with an excessive focus on the technical professional aspects of translator training uh, which means that you in a sense yeah you neglect the fact that well translation is an intellectual endeavor in its own right it takes place in a certain social political economic and so on context and that this has to be accounted for scientifically as well i think we definitely need to move forward in that direction and, and, and rethink at least parts of translator training in that perspective. Do you have any ideas of what kind of research we need or would be useful for young researchers to look at? Well, tons. Yeah, uh, yeah. well, uh, I've just mentioned one, namely this notion of a combination of strategies uh, in the management of multilingualism for organizations, states, supranational organizations as well. Uh, what is the role of translation in that context? How does it fit in? How do you organize complementarity between different, uh, uh, different strategies? Uh, I think there is a, a whole range of possibilities there. Also in terms of uh, uh, the practice of, of translation, I think that it is only insufficiently characterized as an element in, as, 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 as um, well, how should I say this? It is insufficiently characterized as a response uh, of connected to different types of goals. The goals pursued by individuals or organizations or states when engaging in something called translation or interpreting. Uh, uh, these are, in a sense, underspecified, i.e. Mm -hmm. it's taken for granted that, okay, well, we're going to translate, let's do it. I think uh, uh, there is room for a much closer investigation of why we translate, mm -hmm. uh, 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 for what reasons, whose interests are being pursued, whose interests are affected in what way, uh, and I'm not, certainly not meaning this, you know, this questioning or this focus on, on interests uh, in a judgmental or a sanctimonious fashion, as, 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 as would be the case in certain perspectives, which are prone to denounce or uncover dark hidden motives. It's not what I mean. Just trying to understand, to simply list and identify and post possibly measure, well, if you translate in this way or in that way, what are going to be the consequences and for who? I think this is underspecified mm -hmm. and there's a whole range of topics there. That's more 
politics and economics, surely, or political economics. You could go back to the economy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, again, you know, I, I believe in a continuum in the social sciences, and when I talked about the social economic sciences in the broad sense a few moments ago, I, I, I really mean it. I, I've seen you talk a couple of times for the at the Directorate General for Translation of the European Commission, and you've been spectacularly impressive. It seemed to me that you, you were saying quite subtle things about multilingualism, how translation can help protect mm -hmm. and develop multilingualism. But it seemed to me that people were understanding that you were saying something like, economically, if a social system has two or three languages, mm -hmm. it can be more efficient or happier mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. better in some way. Yes. Oh. Is that, that's a radical statement. Mm -hmm. Are I you can making see. that statement, or is it a misunderstanding? Uh, to a large extent, I am. Uh, now, wh what I'm saying is that you, you need to look at multilingualism at different levels. Uh, it is not the same thing if you look at multilingualism from the standpoint of the individual taking on itself on his own, or uh, at the level of society as a uh, on the one hand, uh, an aggregate of individuals, but an aggregate which is also more than the sum, the addition of the individuals present. Uh, it is also a different uh, uh, matter to look at, um, at multilingualism from the standpoint of an organization. So, at each of these levels, you would apply different instruments to assess the benefits and costs of multilingualism. Now, under this general, uh, uh, I say this, under this, 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 against this general backdrop. Um, it is generally the case that more linguistic diversity is advantageous. More diversity brings more benefits than, than it entails costs, quite generally. Uh, now, this obtains, uh, well, let, let, let's give a couple of examples. And, uh, one of them is rates of return on language skills. People who speak more languages, all other things being equal, including their training, including the number of years of experience, including controls for the economic sector in which they live. The more languages you speak, the more money you make. That's the general rule. There are some exceptions, but by and large it holds, it holds quite well. Wherever we have data to, to run regressions that enable us to make those, those estimates. If you um, look at uh, how at the level of society, and you look not at private but at social rates of return, you generally find the same thing. And one paper that I'm working on with a colleague of mine who works in uh, developmental economics, and which is going to come out in, in a few weeks uh, or a couple of months, at a book with I think multilingual matters, um, is that contrary to what is often assumed. Linguistic fragmentation in developing countries is not, cannot be statistically associated with lower growth rates or lower per capita mm -hmm. GDP, yeah. but quite the opposite, mm -hmm. quite the contrary, uh, uh, i.e. more linguistic diversity is associated with a better macroeconomic performance. Okay. Uh, and at the level of uh, organizations, and this is only incipient, and this is another line of research which might be interesting for some students, uh, it is all the stuff about multilingualism and creativity. We've got lots of, you know, sort of meta notions floating about, uh, most of which have not been researched in depth, and they deserve to be. And new links are currently being developed with people from management where they have a fairly vague notion, uh, well, they usually approach linguistic diversity or cultural diversity in a firm in very, very loose terms. Now, if you look more specifically at modes of multilingual communication in such organizations, it is uh, and it's a, 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 a hypothesis for which there is a fair bit of anecdotal evidence, but it needs to be checked against hard facts. Um, I mean, but at least we can, you know, it, it's certainly worth investigating uh, uh, the, how individuals and teams, if they are multilingual as individuals or if they are multilingual and operate multilingually as teams, can be all other things equal, uh, all things being equal, more productive, more creative, more innovative. Mm -hmm.